Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me uh, online as well? Yes. Okay. Uh, so let me uh, uh, just start by saying that uh, these uh, weekly research seminars are uh, part of uh, UNICEF's 15th uh, anniversary uh, celebration. So we are very uh, pleased and honored to welcome uh, uh, Rosa Buenel Fogarty. Uh, from uh, King's College uh, London, who uh, has actually joined us physically uh, uh, this uh, week and uh, last week. Uh, she came as part of a uh, delegation, uh, a two, not men, two women delegation to Seychelles. Uh, during the month that we also celebrate uh, Fed Afrik, one of the fets or festivals that we observe here in Seychelles. So Rosa is a lecturer in postcolonial and comparative literature at King's College London, and she's a doctor in English and Francophone postcolonial literature and theory. She specializes in Indian Ocean literature and researches on the culture of creolized societies. Uh, like I mentioned before, Rosa's uh, specialty is uh, for the moment she's focusing on what she calls FET, like FET of Week, for example, uh, and uh, festivals. Uh, so, and this is uh, what she's going to. Uh, discuss today in her presentation. So uh, I will leave the floor to you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me um, today and for inviting me um, you know, to talk to you for this research hour. It's even greater to be here for the research hour for the 15th anniversary. So I understand that this is like a recurrent event um, this year, but um, you know, for such a young and also such a thriving university, we've been here a few days and already like we've seen so many people having meetings with you know Korea, Kenya, and like this really a sense of you know Seychelles looking outwards and a lot of things happening here. So, you know, I'm very happy to, you know, be part of that in, in, a, in a small way, but anyway, in a way. Um, I want to thank in particular, so the people that hosted us today, I know that this is also something that you do very well here. I've noticed uh, Ananya's lecture, how you will, you know, um, give everyone thank you. So I'll try to do my best. But I know that there's loads of people that, you know, participated behind the scene in facilitating Ananya's and I, um, you know, trip. So um, I would like to thank Madame Joanne Perrault, so the Vice Chancellor, uh, the two deans, and we had also a wonderful meeting with you, so Dr. Justin Zeline and uh, Michael Hall, and Dr. Michael Hall. And obviously, I would like to thank very much Dr. Panda Chopi, who really, really um, was instrumental in helping us coming here and, you know, in starting this collaboration. And it's just fantastic that we have, you know, that uh, we've had her with us, um, you know, um, in this new kind of uh, theoretical research and, you know, empirical adventure that uh, we're on here. So I will, what I'm trying to do today is to give you just a sense of uh, my research like trajectory so that it will help you hopefully understand kind of where, uh, how did I get you know, to think about festivals in the Indian Ocean and why that might be important. And also the theoretical framework that, uh, you know, I mobilized to think about these different ideas. Um, so I think uh, I'll start by talking a bit about my PhD um, and then I move on and think about some of, you know, the keywords that I put in, that, in this title and why they're important, etc. So I do that. Um, 
Yeah, so I come from a literary background, as uh, Benda has said. And so when I began my PhD research, I was very much interested in looking at the literature of the Indian Ocean Islands. And because um, I started with a, a kind of a clean slate, I was most interested in post-colonial uh, you know, literature and how um, the, the French and British rivalries kind of uh, shaped also, you know, what happened in these post-colonial places. I thought the generation was a very important space to start with. And also thanks to Anania, I forgot to thank Anania Kebir. So <laughs> let's retry and say thank you also to Anania Kebir, who, uh, Professor Anania Kebir, who was my super, uh, supervisor, PhD supervisor, and who's now my compare and, you know, <laughs> and mentor still, uh, and that's also very much thanks to her damn hand that I can present to you today. So thank you, Ananya. Uh, so I started my PhD with um, this idea, and I was very much interested in looking at the archipelago, so looking at the different islands together, because it seems to me that they tend to be, um, you know, kind of look through a very national, uh, national sort of uh, lens, and focusing specifically on, you know, Mauritian literature, Vernon is, you know, this type of thing. But starting from scratch, it was very difficult for me to access things in the Seychelles and in the Réunion. Uh, but we've seen the Seychelles um, and the Mauritian literature kind of loomed very large or in uh, the Francophone sphere already. So I thought it would be a good way to start from this, but I didn't want to, you know, give up on some of the ideas that I had. So I was still thinking about the archipelago and how do we, um, you know, does that still exist? So the archipelago is obviously an assemblage of uh, islands. You know this very well because you live in one. Um, and um, I noticed that Mauritius was open to about a single island, whereas Mauritius has dependencies, and you have very good contact with Rodrigue, for instance, which is kind of like erased from the map of literature when you, you approach it through a sort of, in, uh, you know, uh, anglo and francophone literature angle. And so I wanted to um, to think about Mauritius. Uh, as an archipelago, and to connect this with uh, the idea also of relationality in the sense um, that Gleason has, uh, you know, conceptualized it, that is very much tied to his idea of pluralization and so of pluralism culture. So how does that geographical, you know, connectivity, geographical um, diversity in the sense of these many islands also is tied to a history of colonization and an understanding of what that, what it means to you know live in a creole culture essentially and how does that reflect in Mauritian literature so I had to do a lot of um, you know historical uh, and um, geopolitical research to kind of understand how creolization features you know in a, a Mauritian landscape and in doing that, um, I found that Mauritius had a very kind of um, tense, uh, you know, relationship to its um, history of creolization and to the idea of Creole, right, uh, Creole culture. So um, there's a sense that despite the fact that, you know, Seychelles and Réunion and Mauritius very much share, a, you know, a, a history of creolization, um, there's loads of, you know, things that they have in common in terms of the patterns of colonization, but also obviously slavery and indentureship. Um, despite, you know, this common history, the language, you know, the Creole language is extremely important, uh, and some of the, the Creole practices around performance, etc. Despite all of this, there is a, a, a tendency in the literature and the discourse around Mauritius, there's a tendency to not recognize themselves as Creole, and actually Creole is, you know, a name for a very specific community, who is very much discriminated against and who is kind of at the bottom of the economic ladder, if you like. And so uh, I think you were acquainted with Rosabel Boswell's, uh, you know, theorization of all this and you research in all this and she calls this the malaise créole. So I kept all of the, this is all important because uh, obviously here, as my journey evolved, I then, you know, um, thought more about how Seychelles might be a counterpoint to that. And uh, Professor Kebe really uh, talked about it, um, talked about the aspect of Seychelles um, in her lecture on Saturday. So, as I was doing, um, as I was doing this research, I'm still, you know, a literary scholar. So I was looking for books that speak about the archipelago. Where is, where are the other dependencies? Are they represented? And I did find, um, I did find that there was like a, a in contemporary. Um, uh, Mauritian literature, there are a few books that are actually very, you know, um, quite well-read books, quite well-known, that address that think about these other items. So Diego Garcia, 
is the identity of the shaggers. So the first Shinnes titled book, and this is a much, much more recent book that's been uh, published in the USA by Natasha Tupamanian and Luke Williams. They both think about this issue with the shaggers um, and you know the US and uh, the British uh, government. Well, Sophia Valanda Demi thinks about Rodrigue, and uh, Copy de la Viant actually goes even more outwards and thinks about the Comoros. So I've kind of thought again about um, how, um, you know, I was glad to find like the archipelago represented in these books, and I tried to see what the archipelago was doing, why were they projecting themselves into, you know, these different island states. And so in doing that, I noticed that there was a lot of uh, you know, that these women, a lot of these women would uh, think of themselves or would be thought by other people as being Indo Mauritian and often discussed actually the history and memory um, of people that would be considered Creole in Mauritian, in Mauritians. And so that actually writing these books about these histories that were kind of hidden, about these islands that were not quite as well, uh, you know, integrated in a sort of Mauritian consciousness was a way for them to express a form of solidarity. Uh, you know, uh, intercommunal solidarity that might also talk against what's happening in, on the political level in Mauritius about, uh, you know, Creole and Creolization. So kind of advancing an idea of Creolization, but through their literature and through this project projection into an archipelago. So one thing that... Um, sorry. Great, thank you. One thing that was very important in my research is that once I, you know, I was doing all this and I was learning a great deal, uh, I've understood that actually these uh, these books, as good as they are and as interesting as they are, they are very much, uh, you know, part of the the public um, publication circles and networks that are connected to Europe. So to Yanima is, you know, a very prestigious uh, Parisian uh, publication, and what we see uh, six year old editions that is a similar case but uh, in London. So as I was, you know, as I was learning more and more about the, the literary uh, culture of the Indian Ocean, um, looking upwards from Mauritius, I um, I discovered that there were a lot in fact of you know local publishing um, and culture in publishing initiatives and uh, publishing houses and uh, generally like cultural initiatives. That were really thriving and I didn't get a chance to you know get into for my PhD because I needed to by the time I arrived at this point you know I had spent too much time looking at specifically Martian literature so um I've uh, so this is what I'm now you know going to focus on essentially thinking so finding the archipelago not only within the text that are then published in you know in Paris and in London etc but actually finding the archipelago at more of an institutional level and an infrastructural, uh, in, yeah, institutional level, organizational level. How are the different island Indian generation and Southwest Indian Ocean, how are they connected by these cultural initiatives, you know? So here we have a publishing house, actually the Nomad, that's a Martian one, but um, the book, uh, Michel Hacko, <coughs> sorry, the result, is actually a Malagasy writer, um, and he projected it for, for, for a year to call so it review um, on literature. And that does the whole of um, uh, it's produced in Mayotte and by people in Mayotte, but it's uh, every issue focuses on a different island or a different space of the Indian or a different space of the Southwest Indian Ocean. So, for example, there's been Zanzibar, Djibouti, the Commerce, Mayotte, Reunion, Mauritius. We're yet to see a Seychelles one. So, you know, this is, this is partly where I'm here as well. Um, and so, and the last one is, you know, the Indian Ocean Commission that I'm sure you're very well, uh, you know, aware of. And this, this, uh, so there's also, I've started to see that there were loads of literary prizes. Uh, loads of these um, literary prizes that also took place in, um, uh, that were delivered, you know, in literary festivals. So these different, uh, development of local literature kind of created inter-island, you know, connections that I'm, I want to investigate more because I'm interested in um, how the local, even, uh, you know, institutions, um, events, and also the policies who participate in these, and um, and the ones also who, who don't, you know, some of the institutions that might be more uh, nationally based, 
what sort of discourse are you know do they produce about the Indian Ocean space uh, through these events, and what do they? How do they talk about that region? How do they uh, imagine, you know, the connections that they are producing physically by doing these, uh, do having these initiatives? So, and is colonization part of that discussion? Right. Uh, so, in order to answer this question, uh, I would very really much need this. This when I react, I would very much need to integrate also the Creole festivals, because they are book festivals, literary prizes, but to integrate Seychelles in that discourse, Seychelles is already part of it because it's already part of the Indian Ocean Commission, etc. But for instance, it hasn't necessarily, or as, as far as I know, it hasn't featured in a more literary aspect of things. And so um, where I say it's very important in terms of the Creole festival to inspire these uh, you know, inter-island connections, because obviously the Pro Festival is the one that inspired the one in Mauritius, the one in Rodrigue, and the one in Réunion. So um, this is where the sort of more uh, heritage-based, um, or the approach that it's not just literary, but also heritage-based comes from. So, so yeah, so I've decided to focus on Pro Festivals, Book Festivals, Literary Prizes, and using that materialist approach, that I was kind of describing to you when I was thinking about institutions, right? So instead of just thinking of the text, what's the context of the text? You know, what's the the political, um, the economic context of production, essentially, using uh, information from field work so that I kind of started uh, here, although only scratching the surface, I have to say, but meeting, so the idea is to meet with cultural um, actors and practitioners, meeting with people working in these organizations, and obviously attending these events and see what happens there. Um, so just to give you a sense of, you know, what I mean by materialist approach. So materialist criticism is a right umbrella term uh, for forms of criticism which share a concern with the mode of production of the object under scrutiny. An analysis of the socio-historical relationship between the objects, so in this case, the object is going to be either like the performance uh, produced at a festival or the, the book, you know, uh, that's winning an award or that's circulating also in a festival. It's a, a moment of production, it's a moment of reception and a reliance on the material or concrete substance and effects of existence. So thinking about, you know, the, the economic aspects also that are very important. Um, so in practice, materialist criticism offers an account of how uh, works of art make their meaning in relation to the basic economic condition of their creation on one hand, and on the historical ideological struggles surrounding the work on the other. So, so far I was thinking a bit more about the historical ideological struggles, um, and now I want also to add this, you know, economic condition of that creation. How, you know, the, the relationship between audience and creator as well, the need and the demand, et cetera. So using a, a materialist approach also means thinking a little bit because thinking about the economy is also thinking a bit about uh, you know, class and how uh, uh, having a bit of a sociological approach to literature. So using Pierre Bourdieu, for instance, and thinking about how certain prestige is being created, you know, through the organization of these events. It's a way to celebrate and also to, you know, produce a sort of symbolic capital that's attached also, that's, you know, attached to the prize that you receive or, you know, to being part of a festival, etc. the acknowledgement that you're receiving and uh, the fact of being seen in that space gives you prestige, right? And, and that's a very important, um, you know, capital in the world of culture because in the world of humanities and culture, there isn't a lot of economic capital going around. So, um, yeah, this is kind of like the critical vocabulary that's part of this thinking uh, that I want to, you know, integrate. So, obviously, thinking about the production and circulation of cultural products, such as textbooks or performance in these archipelagos, is also thinking about how they are influenced by their marginal position in the world market. As I was saying before, you know, books by and that are produced in Paris. OK, but what's happening here and how, you know, how can, do they compete? Is that even what they're trying to do? You know, what, where's, what's the impetus of all this activity that's happening here? So um, I have some, you know, because it's all at the beginning, I have mostly questions and uh, I'm asking myself and I'm going to be that, you know, going through the whole research. So, how globalization in its newest neoliberal and digital form 
interest is local cultural production and formation of inter-archipelagic initiatives. So, you know, kinds of productions that we endure, we're receiving from everywhere is kind of impacting what's happening here, whether or not it, it is. And how do these festivals serve to promote local culture and talents to compete with exported, readily available, young and household cultural products from major international producer of literature, music, and films, right? So there's an idea of like, you know, how can we see an influence? Can we see uh, cultural practices changing? You know, because aesthetic, you know, aesthetic choices and um, uh, references are changing with, you know, being exposed to more content from different parts of the world, for instance. Um, but also, how does that actually, um, is it something that actually helps also promote what's happening here? You know, is it harnessed in a way that's uh, empowering as well? So um, it's particularly interesting to do that research here, I think, because um, of colonization and of Seychelles relationship to the pro, to its own, you know, pro culture. Pro culture has a very interesting relationship to globalization. So the mercantile globalization of European expansion is there and, the, you know, is the birth of feral societies. And we know that the, that the we know about the violence that's involved in that process. Um, in that strange tension between the, you know, the violence that uh, to an extent created, you know, what we have here today. So thinking about this in relation to like what's happening now. So how can we learn from, you know, um, fertilization relationship to globalization uh, in that new year, the 21st century? How does that work out? So to quote her once more, um, Rosabe Boswa has articulated that quite well. So both, both mercantile capitalism and global capitalism encourage agency and creativity in colonization. However, the smaller scale, slower pace, lower proliferation, the more tightly controlled spread of mercantile capitalism localize the process. Today, the heritage and identity are metacultural products influenced by vast transnational flow, flows in globally controlled environment. One thing that has not changed is that colonization then and now involves complex processes of internal restructuring, inventiveness, and reflexivity. So how are we going to see that at work, uh, you know, in the festivals that are, and in the different, you know, um, cultural initiatives that I, um, I would like to uh, think about? So some more questions attached to, you know, this particular question of globalization and colonization. So globalization has a worldwide impact. So it happens, you know, we're all thinking about this. Um, even the Americans that were kind of like, you know, we were worrying about them because now they're thinking, oh, Korea, South Korea has a lot of, you know, um, the same sort of, uh, they have a lot of, um, uh, how do you say that? Yeah, impact and influence on the youth culture, for instance. So it's a worldwide impact, but during generation um, societies with pro-life cultures have a better way of understanding, adapting and dealing with it because of that, you know, history of proliferation. And could globalization be a form of re of culture? So this idea of empowerment, can we think about this? You know, it might be the opposite. We're worrying about the opposite, but I suppose it's interesting to think about whether or not there might be something here um, that's positive that come out of this. And how do we identify what that positive thing could be? So, yes, so I would say a tiny bit, okay, I'm good for time. I can slow down a bit. So um, the, the three, as I said, the three cultural initiatives that I would like to, to focus on in my research are um, pro festivals, book festivals, and literary prizes. However, uh, today I'm just going to talk because we come here, you know, we came here under FETA so I thought it'd be more interesting to focus just on, um, on these aspects. And um, so I'd say a little bit more about what I've found so far. As I said, this is a beginning. So, um, and also, you know, I'm here in front of you, you you've been to the Crow Festival and I haven't. So I'm here kind of in a, a humble position, also very curious to hear what you think uh, about these issues that I think are uh, extremely interesting. So I'm more going to uh, talk about this in terms of like, um, what are the different, you know, what, what's the, of, what are the overarching questions that we can address? And what are people thinking about when they're thinking about these issues worldwide and how might this apply specifically to, you know, here? So, 
festivals are public events that celebrate the lived experience uh, by, represent by representing it, right? So festivals identify and preserve these experiencing by signaling, you know, their importance and also um, institutionalizing their importance as well. So especially when these festivals are, you know, repeated. Um, but they're also always a temporary, you know, ephemeral that happen and they go, they perform their performances. Uh, they, they happen within a, a bonded, you know, time bonded celebration. Um, and they're also often linked to ideas of memorialization. Okay, so remembering the past, a form of celebration, not only of the leaf present, but also of something that perhaps um, it's already gone. That's, that's the interesting tension with, you know, the idea of the festivity and the festival specifically. So there's been some research done on, on festivals um, and uh, by, here I have David Pika and Mike Robinson, but there's others, and there's a general um, uh, understanding that festivals uh, are on the increase, okay? There's loads, there's more and more festivals, um, and one of the explanation uh, that people um, in the last two decades, three festivals are increasing, and one of the um, explanations that uh, David Pika and Mike Robinson have, you know, come up with is this, um, is this, you know, the relationship with globalization again. So the explanation for the recent proliferation of festival is complex, but in part relates to a response from communities seeking to reassert their identities in the face of a feeling of cultural duplication brought about by rapid structural change, social mobility, and globalization process. At the same time, the growth in the number of festivals also reflects the feeling of crisis in situations where recognized systems of symbolic continuity are challenged by realities of new social, economic, and political environment. So this idea that perhaps the, the festival actually registers and is, is um, registering and recording and capturing something that's going, right? And it's here to maintain, uh, you know, perhaps a heritage that it feels like it's, you know, slipping uh, between our hands and between our fingers. And so, uh, also reacting to this, this idea, and there's also the idea that it might react to um, economic also and political environments that are very much changing. So the Creole Festival uh, in Seychelles, as I said before, perhaps that I don't know how much, of, you know, uh, I don't know how much you would recognize this in relation to what's happening in Seychelles. I'd be very curious to think about that. But as I said at the beginning, um, it's one of the most important, you know, Creole festival was wild. It's the longest as well. We know it has inspired the other uh, festivals as well, elsewhere in the region and in Hodrig. Um, and so they celebrate that Creole heritage um, and it's for, you know, the community, but also for the recognition of that community worldwide, right? Um, Seisha is very active, I was, you know, a very, uh, intrigued and impressed by this, Sisha is very active in getting recognition from international, uh, you know, institution such as UNESCO. I've seen that you have a, a huge program um, with UNESCO, and uh, obviously UNESCO is one of the key players in, you know, in the promoting humanity world and promoting uh, culture worldwide. But it's also a key player in the economy of prestige. So getting that, you know, um, getting that recognition from UNESCO is also getting an acknowledgement that gives prestige to whichever, you know, uh, cultural product you've decided or cultural practice you've decided to put forth um, as a, you know, as a uh, universal heritage or world heritage. So, um, so the intangible heritage also um, allows for both a um, uh, forgotten, sorry, not Great page, four, five. Okay, open, overlooked, and sometimes even stigmatized, uh, you know, cultural practices to have, you know, that's uh, to have that prestige, to have that recognition. That's also a uh, universal worldwide recognition. Um, and so we know here that it's particularly important, and you've been very active in doing that, uh, because of the the relationship between cultural culture and slavery, and you know, the uh, the attachment, the, the sometimes stigmatized. A stigmatizing, you know, uh, effect of that history has um, on the on the Creole culture, on the fact that perhaps it's less, you know, studied than other cultures, etc. So it's particularly important 
And uh, I think you've recognized this, it's particularly important to do that here. So this is where I think, you know, this worldwide kind of like a, a, a upward looking um, of the, you know, the University of Seychelles kind of also speak to that desire to be, you know, recognized internationally and to work against, you know, history that has worked against the people here. So the rise in UNESCO intangible heritage also corresponds, you know, such as like festivals also corresponds to a certain anxiety over globalization. So that's also what the, the, the research says about you know, this at the same time as you have a, a rise in, you know, festivals and cultural festivals, you have a rise in, you know, application for this intangible heritage. Obviously, it's also because of the history of UNESCO that was just monuments first and then only, you know, intangible heritage. But there's this, you know, rise of wanting to be, uh, wanting to recall things and wanting things to be acknowledged, things that weren't up until now. So, sorry, I finally arrived at this point. So, um, by the late 1990s, much more than national pride and cultural diplomacy was at stake in reference, for, in reference to the work that UNESCO was doing. For questions of cultural preservation have become globally salient as a result of bringing disquiet over the impacts of globalization and the widespread belief that cultures were now being corroded far more strongly than they ever had been before, in, than they had ever had been in the past. Good traditional values, practices and forms of knowledge to survive the onslaught of a global mass culture. These anxieties developed a certain momentum and a tide of opinion began to grow in favor of a new system of protection, recognition for heritage in its material forms, right? So the idea of the intangible heritage is also attached to this, you know, uh, fear around it disappearing. So immaterial forms of heritage have also bonded to materiality, right? And the preservation and celebration of them is also tied to globalization by way of tourism. And I think that's particularly important to think about this material aspect of the immaterial, uh, of the intangible in the Indian Ocean Archipelagos, where tourism is a key driver, uh, a key economic driver. And, you know, how can we think about heritage preservation and environmental preservation together as well? So we are in a space where we have a lot of tourism that we know is also impacting the environment. We obviously have the, the climate crisis going on. And so all of the, the, the key issues are kind of concentrating, uh, the key issues of, our, you know, of the next few decades, I suppose, are concentrating, in, I see them as concentrating in this space um, and in this articulation of thinking about how do we preserve culture and how do we preserve culture in a way that's also preserving the environment and how these two are interlinked. Um, and it's important to think about that in a with a materialist approach because obviously of the the importance of um, the tourism economy here. But generally, the fact that um, well, people need to live. Right? We need uh, culture doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? We need institutions behind us. We need funds behind us for things to you know take place. So. Seychelles, again, so Seychelles is a very important place to think through these questions as much work is being done here about this already. And yes, we have many discussions that kind of um, reflect that. I've written this before coming here, and now I'm even more convinced um, that a lot of things are happening here, and that's a very key place. So there's a, a few more questions that... Uh, no, sorry, I'll move on to something else. I've already... No, yeah. There's a few more questions. I haven't finished on this. That the, the project kind of articulates uh, around these, you know, these issues that I've highlighted here about heritage, festivals, globalization. So can globalization with its particular relationship to globalization help us articulate a more peaceful and sustainable relationship between preservation and transformation of cultural heritage? So what forms of queerness are being articulated by queer festivals, for instance? Are they different from any other, from another? And what, you know, are they different from one another between the different islands? And where do they sit in the spectrum of preservation and innovation, right? If it's a spectrum, I'm sure that perhaps a better analogy would work here. But how do the festival registers or integrates transformation that we can see in the culture, essentially? Um, so, for instance, I know that, you know, the Mauritian uh, Pro Festival often has like a, a similar performers. You know, the Frère Joseph are like the, the people that, that keep coming back. Um, and so, you know, 
why <laughs> and what's interesting about this and who you know um how do they what do they say in particular why are they chosen what do they say about you know the pro culture of Mauritius so obviously I've said in my project I've also included the Comoros and the Comoros don't have a, a pro culture as such and I'm also interested in thinking of how can we extend uh, the sort of idea of pluralization beyond you know the beyond the, the islands that are specifically associated with that history um especially because they they are historically connected they continue to be culturally connected and to be involved in these different initiatives not necessarily through the pro festival but they have their own festivals going on that celebrate indian ocean you know uh indian ocean culture what's the link between these two, you know? And um, they're also very, uh, they're also very uh, prolific in the uh, literature. So I think it's an important place to be connected with uh, with the Mascarene and the Seychelles in this question. And it also, I suppose through Mayotte and through Réunion, it also asks the question of, you know, what's the role of Francophonie and of France in, in French language, et cetera, in the Indian Ocean? Uh, what is the what is this you know its impact on the inter-island relationship? Um, is it a disabler? Is it an enabler in any way? Um, it's part of the Indian Commission because of you know having Colonial and Mayotte together uh, as département of France. So um, integrating the commerce also kind of integrates the, the the tension that's happening there between Mayotte and the commerce and the different. Um, the different way they impacted by globalization through perhaps a more like francophone um, uh, version of that, if you like. So, yes. To finish, I want to speak about the book festivals, um, which I think presents a, a different case from the Pro Festival. Um, and I think, particularly thinking because the Pro Festival. I will attach it to like um, heritage, uh, questions of heritage, but to what extent you know, literature is a heritage or to what extent these um, literary festival in the literature that they are um, that they are celebrating and that they are circulating uh, kind of circulate in a very westernized notion of what literature might be, right? So I've learned very recently that there's also Salon du Livre du Monde Créole uh, and Seisha Vox relates to this, so that's something that I also need to um, to add to this and how perhaps they, uh, you know, how they speak to these other festivals that are more uh, targeted also, um, that include a lot of the authors that I was thinking about earlier, that are kind of circulating in a network uh, attached to Europe, for instance. So, uh, what's interesting about these different festivals is that they are uh, they local festivals, that have local institutions behind their local publishers, um, and that there also are places where this idea of you know the connections between these different islands is articulated and is very much part of like the rationale behind these uh, festivals. So, for instance, you know the the advertisement for Salon d'Athéna, which is the one taking place in Réunion, which is quite established. Uh, in, I think last year it celebrated its tenth anniversary. So. It says, this book fair highlights the richness of the literary culture of the Indian Ocean by foregrounding talented local writers. It is an opportunity for these authors to present their works, interact with their audience, and share their experiences. In addition to showcasing local events, we will also work with nationally renowned writers. Um, so what's important here is thinking about the richness of the literary culture of the Indian Ocean, you know, how this is foregrounded, you know, um, in the uh, in the festival and in uh, in the way they're promoting what they're doing, and I've also Festival du Livre de Trudeau Dos is a lot more um, a lot more recent. It had it had three um, editions so far, three uh, uh, yeah three editions so far, and they're taking place in Mauritius in Trudeau Dos, and they they were um, they're organized by Bernard Pierre Moutou, who's himself a, a writer and generally a, a cultural you know. Um, practitioners and activists, and this is a, a quote from him, but from an interview, so that's, you know, it doesn't represent his uh, uh, written eloquence, let's just say. So, Ududus in Mauritian and Salon, I'm um, sorry. Each year, there is, there is the Indian Ocean because we want to develop the Indian Oceanic feeling for us. It is very, very important. So what he means is that each year there are, uh, you know, 
writers of the Indian Ocean that are represented and are intervening in that festival, because the festival is actually organized in a way that it should celebrate a different, um, a different country uh, or a different influence on Mauritian literature. So they did France, they did India, and they did Mauritius, I think. So that's what the, the, the last one was India. Uh, and then again, it's kind of, you know, it's showing the way Mauritius has a tendency of like thinking about its own pluralization and, you know, uh, through all history by kind of dividing all of these um, different great influences that participate in pluralization. So, working with Réunion, working with Madagascar, working with the commerce with Mayotte, and each time there is a country. So, the literature of this country is in the spotlight, right? So, here we see that we don't have the Seychelles, for instance. Though I do think that one time there was a uh, Seychellois writer, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So these are the, the two big festivals. There's also uh, big book festivals, uh, you know, in this region. There's also Mayotte Book Fair. Um, and now, as I've discovered, there's also um, the, well, as I've discovered, you know, as it's, <laughs> as I've uh, ventured to, to find out for myself, uh, there's also Salon du Livre uh, du Monde Creole. And um, I think it's important here we see that there's different questions that are being asked when you look at these festivals because you have again that question of language, right? What language are being represented here? And we see that it's mostly French, they are also in English. I think there's one um, um, publishing house from Mauritius, if I'm not mistaken, that's um, in uh, Creole. But with the inclusion of the commerce, there would also be, you know, Comorian languages that should be represented there. And whether or not that's possible, whether or not that's difficult, and how does this multilingualism also feature in this festival is a, an important question. Okay. But what's also, what I'm interested in is how, you know, in the way they uh, portray themselves, in the way they promote themselves, they're thinking about this, you know, inter-island connections, the connections between these different spaces and, and trying to find, and, generating, you know, ideas and generating connections by just existing, but also kind of producing this archipelagic assemblage by just speaking about the region as, you know, these islands as uh, sharing something, you know, having something in common. So, some questions to finish. Uh, there are, you know, some more questions that I need to ask myself while, you know, going on this project. So, what form of togetherness sorry, is expressed by these trans archipelagic connection and um, and then what uh, connections do they facilitate? Okay, to what extent does it feature or express processes of correlation? And how do material, economic, and environmental factors influence this culture initiatives and the heritage, the arts, the performances, and the texts that they promote and circulate? So how do they influence representation and understandings of the trans archipelagic connections? And that's all I have. So thank you very much for listening. Questions now from the audience, both uh, the physical audience and the audience online. Well, um, uh, well, uh, we all know this kind of a soft part of positions, right? Mm. So there are two other ideas like the Maldives and Sri Lanka. Mm. Yeah, in Sri Lanka, the language is same as the uh, derivative of Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. The Tibetan is a derivative of Sanskrit. Uh, but also, on parts of the Martians, where uh, Hindi influence is coming. So also involving his sense. Yeah. So it's uh is in the thing. We all these kind of relating to a stream here notion and uh surrounded by then it's a voting policy of self publicly. Mm -hmm. So connecting these two informal language traits, one is real, one like is uh Sanskrit, what are your thoughts? Well, I think that's part of um I think that's part of sometimes the difficulty actually in um, in having these relationships, right? Uh, in having these relationships articulated around specifically literature because we, literature is so reliant on language. 
Um, and so if it's not a shared, you know, uh, if it's not a shared language or a language that can be understood, you know, quite widely, then, um, you know, it might not be something that everyone can participate in, can participate in, in the same, you know, that all islands could, you know, come together around uh, a text that actually uh, is written, you know, in that language. The translation plays in a very big role and the translation, you know, uh, between you know global south languages is uh, more rare than between you know uh, global north and global south languages in that way, and so this is why uh, French plays a kind of an intriguing and strange role in uh, the book festivals and in the the literature uh, generally like the periodical reviews etc. Uh, in actually galvanizing the people to uh, work together around literature specifically. So I think. Um, when we think about literature, there's always that question. When we think about performance, then it can be something, you know, then it can it can be a whole different conversation, essentially, because you don't need necessarily that, uh, you know, that uh, uh, language, you know, the, the title to language, essentially. Yeah. Actually, I wanted to quickly also give a response to that very interesting question, if I may, because I don't want to deflect on the other yeah. maybe conversations that then go back to your talk. And that would be another trajectory. But, you know, I think it's a very interesting perspective to give in us, to remind us that there are all these other island um, configurations um, where Seychelles is in, in place. And geopolitically, they're important as well to go back to geopolitics. Maldives, another small minority nation state, very vocal this week uh, in talking about cabinet and so on. Now, you you started by saying that they create soft power. And this is very, I think that why not extend this notion? We can interpret all the languages that you are mentioning, the space that you mentioned, through the prism of Creole. For me, the way the Creole, it doesn't matter whether it comes from Scandinavian or not. Because they want something to do with French and also Spanish But the way I was thinking is different in a One minute. No, I think we can, there is quite an argument. I'm a linguist, but we can, of course, there are two kinds of Creoles we have here. We want to use the capital C which are precisely the historical relations, you know, uh, with the different uh, European languages with their servants and different languages so the romance of it. But I think that if there, why we can think about uh, other creoles of the small C, which is a linguistic category, and it would be interesting to see what is exactly going on with living. Okay, I don't think that we can dismiss it as purely a Sanskrit-based language and say it is belonging to a different kind of language category. Now, as for Sinhalese, I'm, I would uh, say that uh, Sinhalese is not only language in Sri Lanka, you know, so there are linguistic politics of Sri Lanka. So then if you say Sinhalese is related to Sanskrit, you are just not thinking about the ethnic. No, it's related to what I'm not in there. Yeah, so you're not thinking about Sanskrit, you're not thinking about the Burger Creole community, you're not thinking about the, Tab, the Malay group. So these are very small groups, quote unquote, but in an archipelagic context, the small is important as well. So I wouldn't think of Sri Lanka just as a similarly Sanskrit-based linguistic uh, block sitting in the ocean. And neither would I think of that of uh, Maldives. So what I think perhaps Rosa's presentation is helping us do is think of alternative circulations. And that is the peculiar role of French in this context. It's quite fascinating because it is also a hegemonic language, it is also an imperial language. And yet somehow in this configuration, it is bringing out some voices or traditions which could be a big ground under the sensory based uh, approach things in the world. So, sorry, no comment. I shut up. Yes. Well, well so, um, I think it's still connected with what you said. Um, it's been said like an interesting spin on. Mm -hmm. I think we can still see the connections. Uh, just two quick thoughts about this. One, um, this Creole French thing. Um, uh, I have a little bit of experience with this because I'm in the broadcasting media. And, and, and one of the interesting things that happened is that the French, uh, like La Francophonie, creates a lot of opportunities. Of course, we understand that there are the hegemonic um, intentions, not always completely hidden behind. But basically, at the end of the day, uh, that's what we need of intention. It is not matter. 
from the phone speaker. Uh, it, it's a rassemblage of all the French speaking radio and TV stations in the world. Uh, and we have, have conferences and so on. It, it's actually an interesting um, forum and platform uh, to allow uh, the members member organizations to promote their cultural products, like we have the production and so on. The force issue is actually a problem because French is a minority language, and there are very few people. Well, everybody I think understands French, but it's a very small minority of people who speak it very fluently. So we have tremendous problems taking part in these forums. We, we see the opportunity, we, we are told, bring your films, bring your documentaries, we will adjust them on French TV for you, and see you on the road. But then amongst our standards, it's like, but, Keep that back to me, who's the translator, who will do it? So, mm. and, and I see this happening in the books as well. There are not, not many, but there are some Sichuan writers who have been in English, so it's easier, mm -hmm. uh, apart from Creole, of course, mm -hmm. when people want to sort of perhaps reach out to the wider world, they use English mm -hmm. and, and not French. But then when you have all these um, uh, views in uh, like Réunion and in Mauritius and so on, it's mostly francophone, yeah. so uh, the Seychelles writers are a bit cut off. Plus, there are very few people in Seychelles who have read all these books. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we know there's this vast output of books in Réunion, and have very interesting themes that are very relevant to Seychelles, but people here don't read them because they are in French. And then one last thing about this dilemma as well, it links to mind um, a bigger Geo strategic thing about, you know, there's a commission of the OCI, the Indian Ocean Commission, where of course France plays a key role because it's the most powerful country in, in the group, and, and France enjoys its status and would like to preserve. And of course, the, the other member states of the COE try to make use of this, mm -hmm. uh, you know. But then they have an attempt to create what has been called the Indian Ocean Rim. Mm -hmm. And that would have included Australia, South Africa, India, uh, lots of uh, Kenya, Tanzania, all these, plus some other countries like Mozambique and so on, but a lot of wonderful countries. And it's been very interesting to see how France has resisted the creation of the Indian yes. Ring, because yes. then it drowns influence within the wider thing. Um, okay, I'm missing a little bit too, but of course, all this still has connections with. Yeah, I don't think it is a drift. I think it's very important and also it gives me, I suppose, information about something that, you know, and I was wondering about is, uh, you know, do people in Seychelles read some of the stuff that I've talked about in Russian literature? Obviously, some of that has been translated into English. Actually, most of the, uh, except Soupier, all of these, this is in English, but all of these have been translated, the other two have been translated into English. And so I think it's very interesting. Again, we go back to like, the, the beginning, I suppose, of all this for me quite a long time ago was this um, competition between Britain and, and France and, uh, you know, what does it mean to to live in a space where there's this, like, colonial rivalry and how does that shape, you know, the culture for the people kind of uh, living through that? Um, and that's part of it, right, because the, the French are particularly uh, anxious about English, right? They, they feel like it's a... Overtaking the French language, you know, the youth are speaking English, etc. Particularly in terms of culture, and they've been very, um, they've used French as a soft power. Again, they have all of these institutions, the you know, l'Alliance Française, the the um, École Française, etc. They have a, you know, they always have these institutions to kind of continue promote, uh, you know, francophone and francophonie. And um, I think these faces, uh, you know, Mauritius would be, they understand English, you know, they, I think the, the people would read, they read uh, in English, they, they taught in English. Well, you know, it's a different story, obviously, because it's French, so, you know, the, the culture is kind of more and more French sometimes. Um, but so there would be space for these English, uh, you know, session or text. But because I think of the hand in, you know, probably of, certain institution, French institution, in organizing this stuff, then they don't want English to also, you know, uh, penetrate these uh, circles to an extent, because it's kind of a, a voice against English also on the cultural, you know, in on the cultural, so global cultural sphere, to be honest. Yeah. Yes.
Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a bit of a lame person, um, and I don't speak to you all, but I've been here for many, many years. So, with the Creole Festival, which is on the bench, um, from my experience of the Creole Festival, I found that many of the people participating in the festival, or literary and so on, um, they would reach out beyond the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. Because they're not really getting what you're saying in terms of that solidarity and that closeness or you know, that from that French influence. They're looking for African Martinique and Creole yeah. islands elsewhere. Yeah. That are not an easy notion. So we don't really stick to those geographical you know, boundaries of the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously you're using this framework mm -hmm. of the innovation of architecture, yeah. fine, but they show you go way beyond that, and obviously I'm sure British does, you know, they move from maybe to Asia and other countries, obviously they know that obviously France yeah. and other land, but they show because we've not necessarily in the past had so many sort of a strong sort of I don't know, aligned with the Mauritian will because it was not necessarily celebrated when we were celebrating mm -hmm. it. In that, yeah. you know, we were kind of ahead of the game politically, yeah. uh, we used will politically, mm -hmm. so we searched for other real mm -hmm. nations beyond our Australia. That's yeah. what I noticed anyway, and obviously I'm sure other people would mm. That's very, I mean, that's super interesting. I think, I mean, the, the whole in the in academia, actually, the, the Caribbean kind of sometimes overshadows the Indian Ocean. So that's why I'm kind of like Indian Ocean connections. Let's think about this because the, the theoretical framework of, around colonization around archipelagos is very much um, uh, was very much you know conceptualized in the Carib by Caribbean thinkers. Um, so it won't be size of you know talked about them at the beginning, but there's others you know camel breath rates etc. Um, and they um, and so they they really um, uh, shaped the conversation around what colonization is and what colonization means, and um, and so that's why I'm interested in thinking about alternative discussions that are happening. I do think that uh, you know there's a strong tie, and you know it's it's important to think about how the Indian Ocean is connected to the Caribbean. And part of the work that Anania is doing, part of that we're doing here as well with Panda is also thinking you know, about these connections in the cultural, in the pro-cultural practices, um, you know, the, the, the differences, the commonalities, you know, the, of the pro world, and we could extend it to the Pacific probably, right? There's a, you know, there's this uh, desire to, to look more globally, but I suppose I am doing, uh, I'm interested in how prioritization changes in the Indian Ocean, how it's not exactly, uh, how it doesn't correspond exactly to what's happening in the Caribbean, notably because of the connection you know, the, the connections that existed before, uh, you know, Seychelles and the Lunar and Mauritius were actually uh, colonized. So this space that was really like not European, that was very much like a, a, a huge network between India and Africa, et cetera. And also, you know, the place of India in this, uh, or Asia more generally in this discussion, because also, there's also the Chinese immigrants, et cetera, and other people, I'm sure, that are, uh, shaping the way, you know, colonization that have shaped the way colonization is happening here, is happening here. So I'm interested in that. And uh, I'm interested in uh, foregrounding, you know, the pro, yeah, pro culture of the Indian Ocean. And I think maybe it's more discreet. I do think these connections are happening, but part of my, um, part of the whole thinking is like, okay, uh, part of, yeah, the beginning is do, is there inter-island connections and how do they manifest themselves? And so my first question is, is there? And so I found these things, you know, the professor, et cetera. Um, I'm sure I can find more. I've already found more just being here, you know, talking to people. Um, and I'm sure I'll find more complexity also in what's happening in these. And I think it's interesting to think about how the Caribbean features uh, in the professor in particular. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I think I would be... No, I would have... No. But obviously... It's changing so rapidly mm. in terms of the digitalization. So the youth, it, you know, they are connected globally, mm -hmm. you know, more and more than even in the past. 
So, you know, the shift they say over to Asia and a lot of uh, young Asian women to fish the work, mm -hmm. um, Indian origin to fish the work, would have maybe opened up to a, you know, a stronger tie to the Asian world than even our French yeah. fish. Yeah. Which is more the of white you know, mm -hmm. now more, you know, the age of so our sense of 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 our kind of captured elsewhere maybe in, like in in in, in on, online yeah um, so yeah i mean obviously you've got that staff so you can't take on everything mm -hmm. but yeah maybe that sort of shift towards um how sexuality is changing as well like, in more yeah it's not something that i don't know whether we necessarily talked about in Hmm. Um, I feel, I mean, um, I'll just answer that and then my friend has a, a question, but um, I feel, okay, I've spent six days here, but I feel like actually this is something that's really, to everyone that we've talked about, um, there's always the idea of like the children, uh, you know, how are the, the, you know, what are the children doing now, what do we teach them, how can we, you know, preserve certain tradition, how can we, you know, speak to them to, um, to embrace certain aspects of, uh, uh, you know, the crow tradition. And I think I'm exploring this. I'm yet to find a, an equivalent in Seychelles, you know, like, uh, in each of the island. But for instance, in, in Réunion, there's this Maya Kiamati singer who's using all of the sort of um, aesthetics of like YouTube, et cetera, of, Insta, of Instagram, and for, for producing like music that's based on um, on um, um I'm gonna say Mucha, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. So, Manuel, yes, thank you. Uh, Manuel, yeah, yes. And um, so I'm exploring that as well. I want to find, you know, and she's circulating in different type of festivals, but she's, she's going to Brazil, she's going to France, she's going to India, she's going to Mauritius, so, you know, she, uh, uh, so she's obviously popular and she's found a way, that's what I'm thinking, is there ways to empower, you know, is there a way to, is there ways in which things are being referralized by, you know, having been exposed to certain, uh, you know, way culture is uh, produced and also consumed uh, in other places. Michael, do you want to? Yeah, sorry. No, no. Sorry. 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 First of all, thank you for um, really nice and interesting in this sense as well. Um, just, I used to teach a model when I was a few years ago about the concept of language and breaks and relevant. And the focus was also in English. And uh, here, uh, I understand here in Sasha, I thought it was some time ago, there was strategic groups in the education centre to teach certain subjects in, in English uh, rather than Korean. So, um, uh, but what I, what I did find is that there's uh, an obsession to teach English. As a target in to teach a subject in English mm -hmm. in order to enhance the quality of English, which is English has been become mm -hmm. the most prominent language story across the world as well. Mm -hmm. what's, I think what's happening here, Dr. Registrar was mentioned, is that despite structural changes in social mobility, globalization, free all the time to grow, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's on against. And by using things like festivals, and it comes back there to the point I've been saying for. Obviously, here yeah, uh, the lines between curricular areas and other communities, for example, they were moving into regional areas by using them. This is one perfect example of that. My question is what's next? What, where do we go from here, from where we are in, in terms of developing and formalizing the sort of languages and culture? Mm -hmm. And I'm quite like it. You know, through analysis of capital care and small care, mm -hmm. because it distinguishes them in different sides of prayer. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, what do you think is Well, I think, you know, I think there's already a lot of things happening that we're not necessarily aware or that we don't necessarily completely, that we haven't recorded or understood fully. Really. I think, you know, um, 
the future, like we don't plan the future, right? It just, uh, people just, you know, produce culture, produce books, uh, poetry and, you know, and music videos and all that stuff. Um, and then we can, you know, and then what's important is to identify them, find them, celebrate them and see how they can, you know, uh, continue to kind of generate interest in, um, in Creole and in, uh, in gathering things. I think there's a, it's also a question of, um, uh, Dealing what's next is also we all always feel we always feel like the young people are doing something wrong, you know. That like we always think, um, you know, they should. Oh, you know, the youth is going to blah, blah because they're watching. I don't know, they're doing video games. So you know, there's always there's always something that makes us anxious about about them. Um, and I think we need to check what they're doing right, uh, and you know, try to find if we try to see if we can get some inspiration. That's why I was very happy to see, you know, Maya Kamati, for instance, from that year about to, because she's very much uh, targeting, you know, youth culture to, to a certain extent. Um, and so it's what's next is also how do we deal with our own anxiety of seeing things changing, right? Uh, how do we learn from, you know, the how do we learn from what we know already about prioritization, about cruel culture, in order to adapt to, you know, the, the changes that are happening in our societies. Is there lessons that we can, you know, take from this? Uh, so I'll tell you more in like three years when I've done the research. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, great. Thank you. That's very kind. Okay, so no more questions. Yeah, I've I just got one more duty to get to the form. Um, thank you ever so much. Thank you. Really appreciate both of all the parts of the and you know that you brought to us as well. Mm -hmm. So I hope that this has been a consideration when you're looking to create an institute as well. So it's funny from the other side of the other side of the other side. That's what I call this. The, the other side of the other side. But speaking on behalf of the other side, uh, I'd like to um, just introduce three students from the Afro Baronite program. Um, this is a really exciting program for us to take. We're about to undertake a, a massive project on the Afro the organization. Um, and Daniel, and this is the most fantastic thing I've ever heard of. Anyway, I'm uh, here to train and work with our department of business. A business school to to initiate the, the project. It's really important. It's a fantastic project because it's not just giving the business community data to to make money. It's a bad business that we're in like an enriched survey which is to help everyone. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, I'm going to ask about the government department of work. Anyway, um, just as a few words, but it is a massive welcome from all of us with such a lot of things. So I hope you didn't get to read the questions. Yeah, you've got 90, 90 minutes in. Yeah, just a few minutes, just to start to say, I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you that. Just before you start, we just like to thank Rosa yes. and uh, you know, the right wrap up. This uh, presentation and said how very interesting it was. Uh, of course. Thank you very much. I think we might have said because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, thank you, everyone. We're so excited to be here in sessions and thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, my name is Penny Wei Chinguete. I work for the Afro Barometer and the Epidemic of Surveys. I'm here with my colleagues. <coughs> yeah. Good afternoon. Yeah, yeah. my name is Daniel Berry. I also work with the Afro Barometer and the Communications Coordinator for Eastern Africa. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Yes, and uh, good afternoon. My name is Anne Mokelo. I work for Afrobarometer as the Assistant Project Manager for the East African Region. I'm based at the University of Nairobi's Institute for Development Studies. Happy to be here in Seychelles for the first time. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, we'll do quickly, we had prepared a presentation, but it seems we don't have a lot of time. We really wanted to uh, just have some conversation and also share what Afrobarometer is all about. So, quickly, we just, just uh, introduce what the project is and what we are doing and our, where we are coming from. So we basically an African-led institution. We um, conduct uh, data on the aspirations, evaluations uh, of citizens on broad democracy and governance issues. Uh, the African government has been existed since 1999. Uh, and by that time, we are operating in four countries. We have since expanded to like 42 African countries. So I mean, the whole issue of collecting data, we collect data and be able to share with the, the wide range of stakeholders. And the whole issue is to give um, the, our goal, um, the goal basically is to be able to influence policy. We collect information and share it widely with different stakeholders, the academia, civil organization, that means policymakers as well in every country where we have a presence. So we basically operating now in our 42 countries. 1999, that's when we, uh, we, we actually launched the African Barometer Survey, and largely we were in Southern African countries, four countries. We have since expanded, so you see the map here. The only country where we don't have a presence are these ones that are, these, which is not shaded. So we have, we are not in Libya, we're not in Chad, we are not in Central African Republic, South Sudan, DRC, Djibouti, yeah, but largely most of the countries are generally eventually penetrated. They we represent like we covered about already 75% of, of African countries. Um, our survey basically they are nationally representative. The whole issue is to make sure that every person is a chance of participating in our survey. So in every country where we are operating, we ask our um, citizens, our uh, persons in the language of their uh, respondents' choice. We have the same questionnaire that is being used in all our countries, and that allows us to be able to convey findings across the different countries. And we do survey repeatedly, like after every two years, as a way to have an overtime or time series data. Um, our sample size is basically 1,200 in countries that have smaller population, like your Seychelles, your S1 team, the social, that's, um, you know, countries like that. But in larger countries where we have also population are larger, we use a 2,400. And um, yeah, these are the topics that basically uh, cover our survey. We do democracy, government, uh, governance issues. This is we checked this is what we call our signature topics. Since 1999, mostly we have been checking these questions, but every time we move into a different work with survey, we actually ask ourselves, what are the topical, critical issues in Africa that we want also to collect data on? So we have actually collected data on these areas, COVID-19, child welfare number, and a wide number of issues. We already implemented the 10th wave, and these are the topics that we actually have covered. We have covered a number of issues for the 10th wave that we are in. I'll just leave my colleague just to highlight a few issues um, in social justice. So socials participated in the round nine survey. So we are here now working with the US of social uh, for the department, uh, for the faculty, and um, we we'll prepared now for the 10th wave uh, with our partner here in the business of social. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Edwin. So, um, as she had said, uh, we first conducted uh, the first day in uh, Seychelles uh, in 2022. And this is just a snapshot of the findings. Okay? It's just one of the topics of the findings. There are more than 20 topics uh, that uh, we could have presented on but because uh, of time. Uh, these are the only ones that we are going to present. Let's go to the next one. So, um, uh, in round one, which is round nine of Afrobarometer in Seychelles in 2022, we asked um, the respondents the most important problem uh, facing uh, them as, uh, as, as a people and the one they want the government uh, to address the most. And these are the results here. 
And you can see that the management of the economy was the first one, followed by uh, drug abuse, addiction, and trafficking, uh, wages, uh, income, salaries, and uh, and the rest. Um, uh, the, the, the the drug abuse um, uh, finding was um, was in different color because that's the focus of the this much the key finding uh, for this one. Then we also asked them about um, uh, government performance on issues that are most important to social work. And uh, these are the findings. Uh, you can see that um, uh, from the key, uh, the ones in red are those that uh, the government has done fairly well, okay? And those in yellow are those uh, that the government has not really done well, fairly badly, okay? So you can see, uh, number one, education, they've really done well, the government has done well. And um, our focus of these uh, key finding, you can see drug abuse, 55% say that um, the government has done fairly well, but again, 13% say that, um, you know, uh, they've done badly. So if we can go to the next one, um, we also asked them the most effective strategy to reduce uh, drug abuse in Seychelles. Um, and you can see number one strategy that uh, Seychelles was say was intensifying efforts at reducing drug trafficking, okay? Um, then we also had rehabilitating drug traffickers at 10%. We also asked them uh, about their trust in institutions, okay? Especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis combating drug abuse. Uh, you can see that um, um, they have the highest trust in um, social coast guard and the least uh, politicians, you can see. <laughs> Yeah, and second, um, yeah. you can see the second one that we have released leaders, then the vision of substance abuse prevention, mm -hmm. treatment, rehabilitation, and others uh, in that order. So we also looked at um, uh, the role of ordinary students, the first uh, in the fight against uh, uh, drug abuse, and uh, we looked at the demographics in terms of age and deep poverty. Um, this. 44% on average agree that ordinary citizens um, should be in a position and should fight uh, against drug abuse. And you can see in terms of limited poverty index, um, uh, no limited poverty, 45%. In terms of um, age, you can see there um, 18 to 45, uh, 18, sorry, to 35 years say agree that ordinary citizens should fight against drug abuse. Uh, sorry, this is just a snapshot of the findings uh, and specifically on a single topic. We have more than 20 topics that we surveyed and round 10 is coming up. Yeah, I uh, don't know if I have any, I can quickly take you through what we call an online uh, data analysis tool. As we say, we have been collecting data for over 25 years across the continent. And just to be the one should say, like in the islands, like Madagascar, we've been in Madagascar since 2005, we've been in Mauritius since 2012, since uh, around uh, 2018 or so. But if you go to our website, this is just a quick run through. Uh, if you feel uh, interested, you can have another longer session through the Department of Business and Finance. But if you go to our website, which is afrogovernmental.org, you find the landing page. And then on the top, we see here there is uh, an analyze online. So this is a tool that Afrobarometer has created for people who don't have maybe uh, data analysis tools or data analysis skills. You can go to our website on the online data analysis tool. Uh, as you can see, uh, if you click round uh, one, you see only few countries are clickable, like uh, only 12 countries. But when you go to round nine, now you can click many more other countries. So we go quickly go to round nine and uh, since we're in Seychelles, you can click Seychelles, but you can also run the data across all the other countries on the continent. And then you can quickly click analyze. So as you see, we have sort of uh, grouped the topics or rather the themes on the questions that we ask about. But quickly, I can take you through, um, do you have any suggestions for any question or any theme that you'd like us to analyze now quickly or? Uh, okay, fine. I can go to identity, society, and gender, intrafamilial violence. Let's see whether Sishelwa think it's justified for men to use physical violence on their wives or on women. 
So we can see that a majority of Sichelois, which is 91.1%, actually think that it's never justified for a man to specifically hit a woman. And uh, we can cross this against um, variables, for example, for instance, gender. So you can see that men, 91, actually, um, yeah, 92%, Actually, men, more men think that it's never justified than women for, but that's not significantly, just 91.7% and 90.5%. And if you want, you can also cross by age. You can see across ages, uh, you can show the graph. Uh, yeah, many young people, around 90%, think it's never justified for a man to hit a woman. And uh, it's quite it's quite high generally. So, I just want to take you through this briefly, but uh, yeah, since now we have links to the Department of Business and Finance and the University, we can have more sessions, whether online or what to see more about this. Mm -hmm. that's it. So, and finally, okay, if I go back to our presentation, I think you didn't mention this, but in every country, we also allow um, the national partner or the country uh since you say we have a signature number of questions but we allow the country to like, any current issues any issues that you find uh are current to at the moment that we can ask one so in round nine in 2022 um we asked questions on main on drug abuse that's what we presented because that's what we found was the current issues uh so we were here if you have any suggestions on any themes or questions you feel like uh should be asked Actually, <laughs> so, yeah. So, any suggestions and also any person. Yeah. But I, I just have, uh, I just need to express that I agree with uh, my colleague Dean and the from all. Uh, that is a very important uh, project for, for the sessions from the university. I just feel that we need to do slightly trigger. By interest, and I wish that people had more time. Yeah. Uh, because I'm thinking of, of what faculties are going to be on me as before, or the interns, you know, the seminars, because we didn't have much time with some of the years. But it is something that I wish you could have time to present to all members of staff at the university. I don't know how long you will be here, but uh, it's definitely very interesting. So, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, we also wish we could have enough time. We actually do this in so many universities across Africa. We present to students, to power of members, we show them. They actually 